Um, Hello, everyone. Let me introduce myself and my colleagues. My name is Artem Tidva. I am a part of the organization Social Movement, um, trade union activist, have been creating and helping to create trade unions at different workplaces in Ukraine, studying how the organizations tasked with um, protecting labor rights work in Ukraine and how they work in um, other countries abroad. Later, I will introduce all the panelists of our today's event. Our event, the section within the conference organized by the Commons Journal, uh, is dedicated to um, a discussion about labor rights and their role in ensuring sustainable peace globally. We would also like to, with the help of our today's discussion, open the floor to the discussion of possibilities of positive scenario concerning labor rights in Ukraine, guaranteeing the labor rights, the rights of workers. I'd like to um, say a few words about our technical uh, peculiarities of the work today. We have two channels. Um, so the word is Zoom decided to allow Ukrainian users to use more than 30 minutes free of charge. But um, after cancelling the 30 minute limit, unfortunately, um, they, for some reason, did not enter the Ukrainian interpretation, Ukrainian language buttons. That's why we have this English channel and a Russian channel. So if you need interpretation, there is a button you should press on the panel below if you need to uh, listen to what's being said in English or maybe in Ukrainian. Uh, I'll try to repeat that in English. Attention now from Ukrainian to English. Uh, you can put on the globe in the bottom of your screen to change the audio track and uh, you will uh, hear English or uh, Ukrainian opp uh, opportunities to hear us. Okay, I'm back to the Ukrainian channel. Let me introduce our panelists. Today we have with us Pavlo Babic, the deputy head of the youth board of the Federation of Trade Unions of Ukraine and the head of the youth board of the Kyiv Municipal Board of um, Trade Unions. And then Kuril Buketov, our next guest, is not with us yet. He is an expert of the Global Labour Institute, a representative of the International Union IUF of the Workers of Food Industry and Delight Industries. Then we have also Vasily Andreev with us today, um, he holds a PhD in governance and he is a deputy head of the Federation of Trade Unions of Ukraine. Our fourth speaker is Sergei Sevchuk. He is the national coordinator of the International Labor Organization in Ukraine. And then also we have Vitaly Dudin with us. He is the um, head of the um, NGO uh, social movement, Sociální Ruch, and the coordinator of the Trudeau Barona um, Labor Rights Defense. Uh, organization. Today, each of us will talk for approximately 10 minutes, trying to um, discuss the situation with um, Ukrainian working collectives, the veterans of labor, as well as people who are earning their um, living thanks to their own labor, um, people who have no opportunity not to work and are forced to work under any possible conditions. Uh, we'll talk about how this influences the labor market and which um, adaptive strategies uh, employers as well as lawmakers are choosing today. 
and uh, we'll talk about the challenges, new challenges faced by the workers in Ukraine, and then also which possibilities, which chances we have of uh, intensifying or starting perhaps trade union movement in certain areas, um, what potentially the integration of Ukraine into the European Union could give us, which possibilities, chances that would mean for workers and how the workers could rebuild Ukraine in such a way so as to, with our entry into the European Union, to make sure that the salaries, the wages in Ukraine actually go up and level up with the um, European salaries instead of us becoming just um, a cheap labor resource. At the end of the Second World War, um, people saw that the representatives of the workers of the International Labor Organization within the Philadelphia Declaration um, organized the foundations for the um, future development of um, labor that takes place in uh, conditions that ensure dignity. So how can we use the experience of the international global uh, changes to laws in order to adapt them to uh, our Ukrainian conditions and how can um, Ukrainian workers win in this war, which Ukraine, of course, will win as a country, as a nation, because we're fighting for freedom and democracy and for ensuring um, that the rights of people, human rights, are protected. So our first speaker today, Pavlo Babic. The floor is given to Pavlo. You have 10 minutes. Hello, everyone. So Artem correctly pointed to what I would like to discuss today. Um, the young people defending our country. Um, Artem mentioned that he saw our video uh, created to celebrate the Labor Day. So our main message is that um, while young people, while workers are there defending Ukraine at the front, uh, we should ensure that there are no blows that the working class receives from lawmakers um, here on the home front. And also, I'd like to talk about the challenges that we faced. Um, basically, um, it's the same kind of problem, the same kind of challenge that everyone is facing today, which is the war. And we need to do everything in order for this war to end as quickly as possible. So that's why we organized this um, headquarters of material help to um, people, to workers in Ukraine. And we um, talked about it and posted about that a lot, spread the information. We see that as the very topical urgent initiative. Um, half of us, though, is at the front, but the other half is here and helping them on the home front. What we can actually do today to make sure that after Ukrainian victory, um, it will be easier for us to rebuild Ukraine. It's given us the opportunity to influence the adoption of changes to the law, um, governing lab labor uh, rights and labor relationships, because after the war started, actually a couple of laws were adopted, which um, are not really in line with the protection of uh, workers' rights. So first of all, this concerns the possible um, dismissals. This is something that is a challenge for us even now. And then the law which allowed to stop the uh, labor contracts. I'm also part of a trade union at workplace and unfortunately some of the articles of the um, labor contract do not work now because um, the lawmakers allowed the employers to uh, stop acting on some of their obligations so we need to try to influence as far as possible the uh, mechanisms which lead to the adoption of changes in the legal sphere we need to be a party um, in the process of um, such negotiations. I talked about this before the war, and right now um, the communication with the authorities has become even more difficult. I think one of the reasons 
behind those difficulties and communicating our opinion to them and so on is basically that um, we are not finding common language with the um, uh, people in the in charge of the country um, that are digitalized and so on but people in trade unions are not really into the new technologies and how things work in contemporary world so i think you young people really need to become a part of the process because they are the part who speak the same language as our authorities do um in terms of this digitalization and this is something that we need to start working on today because later we'll have no time for this it will be the time of rebuilding our country so finding common languages at task for today and also i'd like to draw attention to another thing i communicate basically every time with people who um, come to work for the first time i do the onboarding i inform them about the trade union and people especially young people very often do not understand what the trade union is what it does why we need it so you basically need to start telling them um, about that uh, from scratch. I think that in educational establishments like schools, universities, um, this should be part of the educational program. People should be informed about their labor rights, about the mechanisms behind the actions of trade unions and so on. Half of the people, I would say, do not understand um, how those things work. So I think we need to change our approach to education in this respect. These are, I think, the key points, the key steps we need to focus on right now. Uh, briefly, I will say that's all, and then if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, Pavlo. And then we finally have uh, Kirill Buketov with us as well. He is an expert of the Global Labour Institute and the representative of the International Union uh, of Associations of uh, Workers of Food Industry and the Light Industries. Let's maybe say a few words while Kirill is planning on his audio and video. Let me say a few words about Kirill. Kirill watched for a long time the changes happening in the human rights sphere in Ukraine as well as in other countries. So we have been uh, cooperating with the international um, that from the viewpoint of someone um, who observed uh, uh, the um, process of attacking workers' rights in a neighboring country, in, in Russia, um, someone who saw how the freedom of um, opinion was attacked. I think Kirill, as a person who saw that, could maybe tell us um, about that. How did it happen? how um, exactly in Russia this situation um, happened, how did it come to this situation when um, on a Ukrainian power plant um, Russian workers are replacing Ukrainian workers, how is that possible? Maybe um, you could tell us something about that. Uh, yes, um, thank you for the introduction and as an international expert i'm gonna speak in english if uh, that is okay for everyone and um i i would like to start with uh with um main thesis which is uh enshrined in the ilo constitution and in the ilo fundamental construction uh which was developed after the first world war when united nations came together to discuss how it is possible to prevent uh, a horrible war like the First World War to happen again. And the ILO was born as a result of the peace uh, process and the peace treaty uh, to say that uh, this is a recognition of the very basic fact that 
poverty in one country is a threat to others because poor population is the most um, suitable resource for the uh, for, for the war propaganda and for, for the hatreds and uh, mobilization of poor people to the war is the easiest task. This is what we actually observed in the past uh, several years in uh, happening in Russia. Um, as, a, as an activist of the labor movement, uh, I was um, indeed involved in several campaigns in Russia when uh, very poor people were trying to organize in the union and to demand um, a more decent salary, more decent pay, and they were faced with, uh, with quite sharp re repressions, which we were not able to explain at the moment. But now looking back in the history of the past several years, we can clearly see that this was a strategy of the Russian government which was supported by the corporations, by the Russian corporations, but also by the international, transnational corporations. And the strategy was to keep people in poverty. I will not be um, using here the statistical data. We all know that it's, it's quite easy to manipulate with the figures, but even the official statistics shows that uh, more than 16 million people in Russia were living and still living be, uh, beyond the poverty level. Uh, in miserable poverty. So of course, these are the people who are easily recruited uh, when they're offered uh, a, a, ser a ser serious or even miserable compensation for their agreement to, par to participate in, 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 um, in the military operations. But that is also uh, the reason why these people are not able to critically evaluate what is happening around them because miserable income means uh, lack of access to the quality education, the education which helps you to develop critical mind. Uh, it means uh, limited access to uh, proper information, good quality information, which helps you to understand what is happening. Uh, so poor people are uh, much easier doomed by the propaganda and 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 uh, this is now clear that uh, for all these years, even in a very very um, a good, a good economical years for Russia, for Russian economy, when uh, the state budget was making mega profits, um, the still the, the level of salaries and minimal wage was kept at a, at a very low level. Um, and when people were uh, raising the demand for the wage increase, they were told this is not patriotic to demand uh, a, a better pay because uh, your country needs more resources. This was seriously an argument we've heard in the negotiations and the, and the plant level, but also from the level of the Ministry of Labor, who was uh, actually supporting this uh, miserable income policy. Um, there were several uh, cases which also surprised us a lot. And these were the cases when our organizers were trying to recruit workers and campaign for the improvements in the multinational companies. And then they were faced, they were uh, faced with, uh, with, a, with a, an attempt of management to get KGB secret services involved in suppressing these attempts. So the union organizing was considered to be an extremist act. That happened in uh, first in Belarus, in uh, Minsk, when uh, the workers of Coca-Cola tried to organize. Then it was repeated at Nestle plant in, in Perm. And uh, in the, there, was, uh, there was several other, there were several other uh, uh, examples. Um, and, um, when we were trying to raise an argument with transnational companies that um, the, the level of pay, colleagues, please. When the level of pay in Russia and in, in Germany is, is dramatically different in the similar plans of Nestle, the same factory which produced KitKat for Germany and for Russia. The two absolutely, uh, absolutely similar enterprises, similar uh, requirements for the quality and for the productivity in these plants, but the salary of Russian workers is 10 times less than in Germany. And the response from Nestle was, 
well, the Russian market is so different. But this is very easy to challenge. If you go to the supermarket and you see the price of the KitKat and compare the price in Germany and in Russia, you will see it is equal. It is the same price in the market. But that means that the Russian workers will pay 10 times less and 90% of their income was just disappearing somewhere. And this was a deliberate policy of transnational companies. So when this war, uh, uh, there's a second war of Russia against Ukraine uh, started this year, we demanded as IVF, um, we demanded that transnational companies have to withdraw from Russia, their business, uh, because by keeping their business in the country, they keep paying the taxes, which are going to the national budget, which is then going to uh, be used for buying bombs, which will be thrown on the on the factories of the, of the same companies in Ukraine. Um, and the response was, oh, well, this is this will not be a, a really a responsible way for us to operate because we have to take care of uh, social standards and other standards. And to be honest, this was very cynical. They didn't care for the standards for all these years, and they have no explanation. There is no argument and no reason for them to keep their business in Russia. And uh, we think that this has to be raised everywhere, but of course, uh, as a demand, it should first of all come from Ukraine, from the Ukrainian workers, probably working in the same uh, companies. That's, that's one thing. Um, in, 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 in another thing which is very important for us at the moment and which I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, as, uh, as we're saying that the ILO as a construction was uh, created uh, with an idea that uh, the peace has to be uh, guaranteed and uh, sustainable. And that is very much relates to the, to the ability of all the countries to implement uh, international labor standards. And there should be international labor standards. Uh, this construction is now under attack by uh, right-wing uh, governments and forces all across the world. People are saying the ILO and the UN system is not able to guarantee and to bring any result. Uh, that actually means that we have to uh, mobilize all our resources to uh, support to support the system, to make it more strong. Um, and here we are also coming to a very practical uh, thing which is uh, related to the fate of our uh, colleagues and comrades from Belarus. Uh, you know that the leadership of the Belarusian Congress of Democratic Trade Unions was placed under arrest uh, after they have spoken against the war. Um, at the moment, uh, more, more than 35 uh, people are in prisons and uh, several dozen of families of the union leaders had to emigrate from the country. The ILO will be discussing and its governing body in November, very soon, um, the situation in Belarus and will discuss uh, for the first time uh, seriously uh, an idea of uh, applying Article 33 of the ILO constitution to Belarus. That is a unique mechanism which was only used in the history once uh, and uh, now we are trying to make every argument to say this is a time to use it in terms of Belarus, uh, which is a mechanism of, of, of uh, sanctions, uh, because this is the way the ILO have to respond to, to the several uh, serious attacks on, on the uh, workers' rights on the international labor standards. Well, there will be a big discussion and debate at the governing body of the ILO uh, there are 56 members of this body, half of them are the governments and um, other half representatives of the employers and the workers. And the employers are trying to stop this uh, because they say, we don't want ILO to, uh, to make this mechanism as a, you know, a regular mechanism. Um, so we shall not pre create another precedent. Here, the workers' uh, voice is important, but we are still in minority. The governments will make a decision. And on the list of the governments, which are represented in the governing body of ILO, we will not find, unfortunately, Ukraine. It is not even in the, in the substitutes list. Um, but it is important if uh, we're discussing the future of Ukraine, that it, 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 
it should become one of the uh, main supporters of the idea that uh, the ILO instruments and ILO as an organization have to be uh, have to get stronger. Uh, and of course, in this situation uh, of today, President of Ukraine is one of the most influential person in the world. I think many governments will hear to the uh, opinion of the Ukraine, even if it's not on the governing body. So that's one of the very practical tasks which we can um, think of in terms of the of the future of, of the country, its uh, prospect, prospects and perspectives for a democratic and uh, social justice uh, construction of the society. So that's uh, this. This is a few thesis which I wanted to share with you. Unfortunately, I was not able to make a, a presentation. It was in a very late minute, but um, I will be happy if you have questions or comments or responses to what I said. And um, yeah, I uh, will be very much interested to continue this dialogue as an international unionist for 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 years. And indeed, I know many of you. So thank you for inviting me to speak, to address you, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, communicate in the future. Thank you, Kirill. I'd like to make a technical pause because there is an air, air, air raid alert all over Ukraine. And we have this announcement from Lviv, from Kyiv. So go to some shelter if you need to. If you have you feel you can continue participation in our event, then I will pass floor to the next person. So, Vasil, floor to you. Can you join us? Head of the Trade Union of Construction Workers of Ukraine. Uh, yes, thank you. I will probably start talking a bit later, and um, I'm inviting our next speaker, Vasil, um, to take the floor instead of me right now. Um, I'm in the center right now in my office, and I would like to move away from that if possible. So thank you. Um, I'll speak to you later. Okay, so then Sergei Sevchuk, the international coordinator of the ALEO in Ukraine. Thank you, Artem. Thank you, everyone, our panelists, and also our attendees of our event, those who joined us online. And I would like to observe where our discussion takes us. So Kirill already mentioned this, the International Labour Organization has been mentioned and um, the code of the statute that operates based on and the Philadelphia Declaration has been mentioned as well. I would like to start from saying that it's a very timely event which we have today um, to talk about the post-war labour market and what that will bring us. Um, we do understand that there is war right now, we have this array the lead, but still I think it's important to start talking about those issues uh, today. I think that today's event is actually um, very timely. As we remember, the Philadelphia Declaration was adopted, uh, was adopted during the Second World War while the war was still ongoing in 44. And the main, um, it, source of inspiration and the main editor was the person that uh, was at the helm of the international labor um, organization at the time. So it was 
um, signed in the White Office at the desk of the uh, Roosevelt, who was at the time the president of the United States of America, who also signed the declaration. So at that time, when the Second World War was still in full swing um, with um, aviation and artillery um, striking and uh, um, Lord um, and what events um, hostilities taking place um, everywhere. Um, even at the time, the international community was thinking about post-war work and post-war rebuilding and the principles that um, this kind of reconstruction should be based on. It seems to me that it's very important that we uh, are meeting today and are starting to talk about the future developments uh, of social and labor relationships after the war while we're still in a war situation. Um, I think it's a task which is perhaps a bit easier for us because we have those uh, underlying documents adopted by um, some generations ago. So um, these would be the Philadelphia Declaration and the principles that are enshrined in this document. And also a series of documents adopted by other organizations like the Declaration of the Human Rights, um, the Bill of the Cultural and Other Rights, um, Labor Rights, and so on which, for example, enshrines the right to the creation of um, trade unions and the protection of rights. And then the um, Rome Statute. And also, we should mention that um, this uh, treaty basically enshrines the um, labor negotiations and relationships as an important part of the social sphere and the labor sphere and then a series of directives of the European Union that also create the framework for the legal mechanisms on the territory of the European Union. And this is something that we also signed up for um, after the agreement and the association um, was adopted. So we agreed to also integrate um, the documents, the principles, the laws of the European Union governing the labor relationships into um, our life. Um, plus many documents which have been ratified since then. In war conditions, what's part of the um, international law, the conventions, um, protecting the fundamental human rights in the sphere of labor, relationships and we should mention that Ukraine ratified uh, eight of them, all eight of them. Uh, we are talking about um, the freedom to create uh, trade unions and to conduct labor negotiations and um, those that um, um, prohibit and uh, fight against child labor and also forced labor and any kind of um, atar targeting any kind of um, discrimination at work. Um, this year, a decision was also adopted on joining the um, fund, joining to the fundamental rights, adding to the fundamental rights, the right to the um, safety and security at work um, with respect to working conditions. So this has been added to the um, fundamental rights. Today, um, Ukraine ratified most of the uh, conventions governing um, those rights. And um, I think we are going to ratify the convention on uh, safety and security in the workplace. So, in terms of the framework, the system within which um, our discussion takes place today, um, basically this is a very comprehensive framework 
which clearly indicates um, what kind of direction we can take in terms of post-war reconstruction and rebuilding. And we understand that there will be quite a lot to reconstruct or rebuild. Unfortunately, we don't have the comprehensive figures today, the statistical data based on the monitors of the International Labour Organization examining the impact of war in Ukraine on the labor sphere, uh, which was published in May, and we are waiting for the second edition with new data. But anyway, based on this May edition, we can say that according to ILO uh, assessment, 5 million, 5 million uh, jobs have been lost compared to the pre-war time, which means approximately 30% of the pre-war level of employment in Ukraine. So we are looking at huge losses uh, in the sphere of employment. And we're talking about this huge dislocation um, people are forced to become IDPs, but also to flee abroad. Um, and many millions of Ukrainians either crossed the border and fled to other countries or became IDPs, as we know. Apart from this, and this is also something that the International Labour Organization mentions in many of its declarations, we see the tendency um, where the aggressor state is targeting objects of infrastructure and those that have some strategic importance for the economy of the country and those that create and maintain the level of employment in the country. So we're talking about enterprises creating employment, creating the chain of supplies. Recently, also, we're talking about um, Russia targeting about the um, energy infrastructure objects. And this has a cumulative effect. It means that jobs are lost by the workers. It means the loss of profits at the enterprises under shell and missile strikes, but also at the enterprises that are, for example, part of this chain of um, supply or those that are the um, users, the consumers of the electricity produced by energy corporations. And this, of course, uh, we are afraid or will lead to, could lead to a further loss of um, employment, further loss of jobs. We hope, however, that the situation nonetheless will reach its logical culmination, logical end. And I hope everyone understands what we mean by that, what I mean by that. Um, this means the unconditional victory of Ukraine. So the tasks we are facing today, the trade unions, the employers, the government, these are, of course, the challenges of reconstruction. I think task number one for trade unions and employers in war conditions is to ensure that trade unions remain or maintain them, and also the enterprises stay in place because they are an important element of the democracy and um, freedom of opinions expressed in uh, labor relationships in the labor sphere and post-war reconstruction without the equal participation of both employers and also workers by trade unions, for example. Um, this kind of reconstruction without this element does not seem viable. So um, international labor organization and also other partners are supporting um, the organizations of employers and trade unions in Ukraine in order not just to support them 
maintain them, but also to provide them with um, direct humanitarian aid through trade union structures, different organizations of employers, different um, networks, um, enabling the supply of humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Um, apart from this, though, when we look at the question of, of post-war reconstruction, I think that uh, we need some kind of reset uh, in the sphere of labor relations. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but this is a challenge. This kind of reset will be probably accompanied by um, um, dealing with such challenges as the dislocation, relocation of labor resources. Many refugees will probably stay abroad. Uh, So we are potentially talking about further relocation of enterprises, um, their return to their initial place, etc. Right now, um, social connections um, are being lost, are being broken, and I think this will continue. Post-war reconstruction will also require new skills, a huge number of new skills. It will be necessary to um, uh, organize professional, technical education and to organize it in such a way that um, we can supply the market um, with the skills that are needed at the moment and to do that quickly. Some skills will be in demand and will be lacking on the market. We should probably expect a huge migration of uh, work because of labor force to Ukraine from other countries, not necessarily Ukrainians, perhaps citizens of other countries. And we should um, pay attention to non-discrimination, fighting against discrimination in the sphere of labor in order for the labor market to develop properly uh, without imbalances, uh, without um, their um, imagine ghettos for certain kinds of workers. The development of um, digital technologies is also an important question. I think that um, this will broaden the sphere of non-standard forms of employment. Even today, Ukraine is the leader um, among European countries in terms of um, the digital labor platforms. Uh, today, this is an important question that needs to be addressed. This will still um, be an important question in the nearest future. And then we have the informal employment. Um, th that sector is growing today. Um, people are actually contributing to the um, sphere of social protection, social care by paying their due to the pension fund. The number of those people is unfortunately decreased. Um, the pension fund is experiencing this deficit in terms of payments they receive. Um, this is uh, an important issue as well. And the last point I would like to make is that we need to um, preserve um, the level of res representation um, in the context of this relocation of enterprises and labor resources. Um, previously, we had this territorial or industry principle um, based on which um, um, trade unions were organized. Today, we need to think about new approaches. Uh, to how the work of trade unions is organized and enrollment into them is organized. So perhaps there should be some alternative principles at work, like for example, the territorial principle should be supplemented by something else, like direct membership in trade unions and so on. So this is something that has to be discussed in terms of uh, which alternatives could be um, found. And then the reform of the labor uh, legal framework um, this is also an important issue. So there is the international labor law, of course, which um, has many instruments 
um, to protect labor rights and creates the general framework for reforming, potentially reforming the um, legal framework to do with labor relations in Ukraine. Um, I think that if we, if Ukrainian lawmakers um, are guided by those principles enshrined in the international labor law, um, this will um, be very, be very beneficial. Um, the current drafts um, adopted in Ukraine uh, are right now being examined by the International Labor Organization. And um, Ukraine is expecting comments from uh, international partners. Uh, actually, the Ministry of um, Economics in Ukraine asked international partners to look at whether the legal norms uh, um, introduced by Ukraine uh, correspond to the principles and legal framework of the European Union international labor law. I think this is a positive development, a good sign, um, meaning that Ukrainian government actually wants the draft law to correspond to European legal norms. Um, so we hope that even if uh, we find some discrepancies uh, between the initiatives of Ukrainian lawmakers and the European um, international principles, still I hope that um, the new law will correspond to main uh, international norms. I will probably stop here and uh, I am open to answering any questions you have. Uh, we are inviting our next speaker, Vasil. Yes, I will be able to talk to you, but uh, I will speak off camera. So I would say that the labor law is experiencing a huge crisis today. And I think after our victory, the crisis will only become more profound and grow. And I will tell you why I think so um, in terms of um, how we uh, establish, assess the situation in our um, trade union of construction workers, but also generally the trade unions of Ukraine. All current problems um, of the labor market, like um, informal employment, um, it's known that one third of Ukrainian labor market, this is informal employment, I'm not quite certain how this is calculated, but if we have, let's say, 20 million who can work, then um, basically just 8 million are insured. And this is a bit more than 30%, I guess. But then if we also take into account military personnel and other people um, who are not insured within the um, social labor system, I think that we arrive at this number more or less. And um, um, wage arrears, this is also a danger in our country, ensuring the um, decent uh, conditions of work, the absence of proper education uh, after a person becomes a part of the labor market, and um, the uh, absence of the lifetime character of this education. I think all of these problems will uh, be exacerbated by the war actually they are right now um, and then the labor contracts um, being uh, um, dissolved by big businesses by big bosses um, when workers learn that collective labor agreements uh, are dismissed uh, dissolved i think that this problem will also become um, exacerbated because of the law on labor relations um, in the conditions of martial law. So the employers sees the chance to inform the workers um, that all the articles of their labor contracts about social benefits uh, are being suspended during the war. 
So all the rules governing, for example, hiring and dismissals, um, this also is something that has been uh, made different because of the war. Right now, employers are not taking into account how vulnerable you are, whether you are a man or a woman, or you have many children and so on. In the construction sphere, we're talking about massive dismissals, for instance, until the economy starts growing again, being rebuilt again. And this is what the construction workers who are dismissed are being told. So all of this um, makes the problem more profound um, within our labor market. And I think the problems I've mentioned have to um, help us draw one clear conclusion um, to point us in the direction of thinking what kind of solution we could come up with. We cannot simply accept that the conditions of workers are becoming worse. Uh, we cannot simply accept the fact that somewhere trade unions um, are still uh, living on and somewhere they disappeared. In our construction sphere, the response to that, to this dire situation is this. Um, we do understand that this is a sector with a lot of uh, informal employment, um, a sphere which has many problems, imbalances of power, extreme imbalances of power between the employee and employee. Um, there are not enough safety and security measures. Um, there are not enough mechanisms to complain about the actions of the employer, um, to ensure proper inspection and so on. So our question number one, I would say, is uh, to somehow uh, contact, stay in touch with um, members of trade unions. So let's say um, there is someone right now working in one region of Ukraine, someone working in a different region of Ukraine. Um, they are outsourced, so to speak, uh, with the technical equipment that they operate to different parts of Ukraine, to different uh, construction sites and so on. Um, so how can they stay in touch and how can they cooperate uh, in these conditions? Here, um, the digitalization previously mentioned here in a negative context, perhaps by Pavlon, uh, when he talked about trade unions being um, afraid of digitalization, seeing this as a huge challenge, uh, seeing this digitalization as uh, something that enables the creation of uh, um, employment platforms, labor platforms, which create a gap between the employer and employee and uh, the trade unions. Um, I think that we are looking at digitalization from a different um, point of view here as something that helps us to ensure that the needs of the workers are heard and taken care of wherever they are. And this is something that we have been working on during the summer. Um, we launched a new website in the autumn to tackle this issue. We are launching the platform for um, education regarding labor rights, labor skills. We started the work on this project in 2020 um, in cooperation with the International Labor Organization. Um, ACTRAV has been an active partner of this process. We would also like to thank the Bureau on um, Problems of Workers. Um, they listened to our concerns about the financial problems and um, engaged us in creating this platform, which very soon will start working on our website and which can be used by any trade union in Ukraine. It also contains all sorts of educational materials, um, not just focused on the construction, sector but also written in such a way that any kind of sector any kind of industry could use them apart from that we are trying to widen um, our networks 
to introduce the members of our organization into all kinds of organizations in the construction sphere. When we see um, that some employees are looking for employees or people are looking for work very often, this is a step where we jump in when we learn that people are complaining, for example, about um, not being paid or um, incurring some kind of injury. We contact people immediately, uh, even if they are not members of a trade union, we inform them about the possibilities of solving the situation, the mechanisms that could help the workers to influence um, their employers or the lawyers or some other parties to the process in such a way as that um, they could ensure the protection of their rights. Um, we tell them about the um, compensation they could receive, etc. So based on um, the experience we've accrued over the years, we can um, lay out all the mechanisms and uh, explain all the um, aspects of the situation. So we hope that um, sooner or later, um, these kinds of contexts we establish in the sphere by helping people uh, will ensure a situation where um, the um, coherence in the sector grows and uh, um, a working uh, network that protects um, labor rights uh, emerges. So we hope that people we've contacted, people we've helped, uh, will be able to share information about us, about people who could help workers uh, with their groupmates, uh, with their workmates, sorry. Uh, because uh, us simply, for example, gluing posters to uh, fences around some kind of construction site, um, this is not really an effective mechanism to spread information. We hope that this will be the case anyway. Um, right now, the construction workers um, are quite atomized as workers. There is not uh, enough coherence. There is not enough networking in the sphere. And we hope to change that with help of um, this sort of uh, contacting and this sort of uh, platform because we understand that um, the people we have already contacted, for example, and the people active more or less in the protection of labor rights could be working um, in vast different regions of Ukraine and could be relocated to a different place. Um, and a few words about our hopes for the future. I think that um, when we look at other structures like agricultural, for example, or public services or hotel industries or um, other spheres, where also the level of informal employment is as high as in the construction sphere, where the destruction of labor rights is also similar, I think the experience we share could be very important. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, Vitaly Dujan um, from Trudeborona, the protection of workers' rights. I'm very grateful for an opportunity to take part in this discussion. And um, I think that the topic of labor rights is very important today. It's a, a scandalous topic for our society. Um, because of whom uh, we cannot speak today freely, I had to go to the bomb shelter. It's very nice that people around me feel not only 
They feel not only alarmed for their own safety, but for the rights of the workers. So let me speak about economic outcome of the war and of the latest reforms. So I'd like to partition my speech in several parts. The background, current state of affairs and the future, as well as my dream as for the situation for me not to sound too scientific. So I'd like to speak about my dream as well. So the labor agreement is some kind of a symbol of welfare, but today it doesn't work that way in Ukraine in particular, because the war is ongoing. This is the war of the Russian imperialism and because our neoliberal reformators, reformers, they do not understand all the risks that their reforms bring because it actually attack against the labor law. In the wartime, war has huge impact over all fields, or all in the industries, including the labor law. You shouldn't forget about this because there is defense attack there's liberation in some way, of course, in different context. There are opponents. And it's not up to me to speak who's a victim and who's an aggressor in the situation of labor relations in Ukraine. Of course, the employers, they have initiative. They can go into attack they can worsen the situation of workers. The workers try to get united, they fight for what they have, but it's very hard for them. Why is it hard? Because there are some historic conditions of that. Because the situation was formed in the way it is. Our economy is ruined by oligarchs. Our economy works in order to supply raw, raw materials and, for example, raw metals and farming produce. And in this situation, when the economy is weak, it's easier for employers to explain the workers why the latter has no, have no right to live properly, why their salaries cannot reach the European level. Of course, these prerequisites, they worsen the situation, workers, but these are not workers who created these conditions. Unfortunately, reformist efforts are not focused in order to implement the latest innovations but to adapt current legislation to the ongoing crisis for the owners, for the capitalists, to decrease, to save uh, some money over the workers. Of course, today we have the crisis and uh, the unemployment rate is up to 35% as a moment, according to the National Bank data. The situation did not change after the neoliberal legislation was introduced. Since March, four laws were adopted, 21 21.46, 21.52, 24.31, Twenty-four, forty-four. I'm sorry for all these figures, numbers, but the experts know a lot about these numbers. These numbers are symbols of attacks against workers. They brought lots of pain and tensions, and they did not solve issues of the economy. That is under pressure of oligarchs and 
Russian impact. I would like to say Russian aggression, actually. In March, there was an issue of unemployment, and today it's also persistent, and it's going sky high. Although the Ukrainian armed forces were able to liberate some territories and the situation seemed to have normalized, there are better conditions for business in Kyiv, Lviv, central Ukraine, but still, those anti worker laws, they are not cancelled. Some of them are temporary, some of them are permanent. Still, they are like emergency laws, and they are enforces of today and labor relations are being terminated as a moment temporarily people go to the courts in order to to protect their rights and 50 percent of court cases are in favor of workers according to our monitor of social movement and you can find the blacklist of employers that actually abused new provisions and in what way workers fought against this. I think there is a problem not about some rare cases, not about reforms being against the European Union or ILO demands. I think the whole policy in uh, labor sector is about minimization of uh, employers' expenses. And in order to consider labor as the goods, you see the labor is being operated by the Ministry of Economy in favor of those who own the capital. In these conditions, we cannot expect some civilized dialogue, development of uh, new labor laws that would be naive. We need some objective prerequisites like no corruptions, free courts, left parties in the parliament. We don't have these institutions. That's why liberalization is extremely dangerous for such countries as our country. Our country has been losing all the advantages it had, like well-educated labor force. Right now, it's cheap labor force only. It's good for some investors, but it's not good for solving the economy issues. Speaking about my forecast, what's next? If a new law on labor is adopted, then we'll have complete degradation of labor law. That would be unfair and that would have a negative impact on our economy. If the employer won't have any issue, as for firing the employees, the employer would do that. Anybody would be fired for any reason. No training. The workers would not be able to object the employer. They would be afraid of them. The employees will not be motivated to improve their qualification. Everything would be according to the employer's needs. For example, the employees would not be able to get additional vacation for getting higher education or second higher education. Besides, we should speak about demographic processes like migration and decrease of births. For example, the law draft 
decreases the way mothers are being protected, it would be more difficult to have a baby and to continue working. So in this way, Ukraine will have worse level of labor protection than in any European country, maybe except for Hungary and some Baltic states. In Hungary, where Viktor Orban simply shut down the labor legislation under the COVID-19 prerequisites and the employers were allowed to regulate almost everything in private contracts with employees. Uh, besides 2012 labor code of Hungary, it was influenced deeply and it's very easy to fire an employee. The same approach has been implemented in the Baltic states, maybe except for Lithuania. Lithuania has some good cases, but still these experiences are part of capitalist world, deeply rooted one part. It is about investments and this worsening of labor rights is connected to generation of jobs. In this way, if we come through this way of neoliberalization by introducing the norms of Hungary, Estonia, then we would have decrease in the number of trade unions, but we'll have unemployment growing because there are no prerequisites for new jobs. Still, I would like to say I have a dream. I dream about that time when the workers will get enough, will have good wages, good for them and their families, and people will be free to choose the way they work, when trade unions would have strong voice, both in the production and on the governmental level, for them to influence any legislation. I'm dreaming about there is no such big gap between Ukraine and the European Union wages, and the government works about less, works on less discrimination. And I hope that those who work with trade unions, they have better compensations, more approaches, and in this way, maybe a socialist economy would be needed with more influence of the state. Maybe it's possible, and I think it's possible. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Vitaly. Let me take some notes. Let me summarize. Let me find some key points. So you have spoken about our neoliberal reformers, about them adopting the labor market to the crisis. I think I have heard that some time before. Haven't I? Because the outcome of the shock therapy or the measures of strict economy, those applied by Margaret Thatcher, for example, that failed years after her privatization and deregulation and anti trade union attempts. They showed that such policy was incapable to create anything new. Instead, it ruined everything they had. All the 
features of the social state, everything was privatized for the small number of oligarchs that had no good impact on economy. Instead, jobs were lost, unemployment grew. I think what you have told us, it echoes those events. And this figure of 35% unemployed, it's really high. And what the Ministry of Economy proposed, even in time of Minister Milovanov, who worked together with Ma'am Tretyakova, who actually said that ILO is outdated as a structure, but all of us know that it was operating long time before them. Lots of politicians actually criticized ILO, like consulting with workers, what, who needs that? No, really, government should speak to the workers and to the hired workers, they stay, they keep working for 10, 30 years while politicians leave. So the Minister of Economy once proposed to fight against the gray economy, gray jobs, by legalizing bad jobs because lots of employers do not legalize the workers because of the high taxes. And instead of fighting non-payment of taxes, instead of fighting for legalization of these workers and for their rights, we have a different process and actually it's ongoing the same conference takes place the center for economic development if i'm not mistaken has it the government officials and business they're planning a different scenario in order to normalize or to adopt the economy to the crisis. But as you can see, every next adaptation to the crisis, it worsens the crisis instead of offering some progress. So we have seen that after the Great War. So we need strengthening of the state, strengthening of the workers. We need to do that. It's not some reaction to the crisis, but it's background for the further growth. Kirillo said this war isn't the first one between Ukraine and Russia. And there was war between Ukraine and Russia before, and it was rather intensive, and people were losing jobs, were losing their workplaces, but the government did not use the situation in order to start an economic boom. Nobody actually did anything. Business did not invest in the territories where everything could be a missile. You can see that missiles came here and it was a risk. Business doesn't want risk. It doesn't create jobs where everything can be ruined. So this is the governmental role to create jobs and it is the role for the trade unions to oversight such situations. So I have a question to our discussion. Mr. Serhii Savchuk, 
he told us that the Ministry of Economy has been addressing the ILO about standardization of this law draft on labor and about risks of which we have heard. So can we standardize it? But I have a question. Is it possible? Can this law draft be considered without workers actually working on it, without dialogue with workers? Because the government has been working hard in order to avoid any contact with workers. Everything is presented as emergency. Laws are adopted in this way that workers have no word and the employers they they're mute and they're saying to their employees okay we've done nothing wrong but right now this is the new law but don't worry it's a temporary law however yes it is said that these laws are enforced for the war time only but after that the employers would have to come back to the standard laws still the employers then want to introduce new anti-trade union law that would not be a temporary one but a permanent law permanent legislation against workers that would normalize our labor market to the crisis we won't have development but we'll have total stagnation and loss of rights lots of people who went abroad will not come back because they will see their rights are not guaranteed if they lost their house if they lost everything and they are not able to buy new housing because the war is ongoing still and so we have these harsh conditions and what kind of dialogue can we have in this way who wants to answer who wants to provide reaction to my question so what can be the dialogue between the government and workers and trade unions and international labor organization today so the algorithm of our action is basically this we are this technical agency that comments on potential conflicts in the view of uh, international law regarding um, labor rights and labor relations we do not take sides that's why the trade unions and the employees and the governments address us, tend to us um, in order to hear what kind of technical objective assessment we could provide them with because we are equally remote from all of them and equally close in cooperation with all of them. Our comments are then, well, anyway, that's the um, design of our work. Um, our comments should provide the instruments to the government, the employers, to the trade unions to enable them to conduct a discussion, a comprehensive discussion about different articles of the draft law, let's say. Bearing in mind that all three parties to the process want to um, implement the international labor standards. And that's something that Ukraine uh, is perhaps um, obliged to um, be in line with because of the international obligations, the ratification, etc., that Ukraine undertook. So, how can um, such and such an international standard be implemented, be enshrined in Ukrainian legal framework? Very often, as we can see, uh, even in the verdicts of the court, um, Ukrainian law prevails uh, over any possible kind of international um, provision. So our goal is to make sure that um, uh, 
uh, all those instruments provided by international legal framework really become tools for the improvement of the situation on the labor market of Ukraine. And this is something that everyone is interested in. The development of this dialogue is something that we hope to see in the future based on the comments we are going to provide um, by the new year, the dialogue between employers and government and trade unions. I'm not um, that pessimistic as um, Artem perhaps, I'm, I'm more optimistic. I think that after the war ends, we will build our future on our own. No one apart from them will build it and nurture us. So I'm looking with more optimism at the potential reform in the sector. I think all of us, we should understand that Ukraine will not be able to become part of the European Union with the national labor laws that violate international European laws, um, proper healthy labor code, a reformed old one, perhaps a new one, um, people arguing, by the way, whether it should be a law or a code of laws and so on. But anyway, the form is not important. The content is, on the other hand. So a proper, a healthy labor code, uh, labor law, will be one of the things that ensures our ascension to the European Union, our integration into the European community. I think this is or should be obvious, uh, is obvious for the expert community, is maybe less obvious for our viewers. I don't think that Ukraine will be able to join the European Union with the kind of labor laws we have today. As to the norms that have already become part of the um, late legal framework, uh, on labor relations in Ukraine, I think the positive side is that the draft law will replace the old uh, labor code. If it's adopted, of course, um, and together with all the amendments that have been adopted, but we will need to focus on ensuring the um, we'll need to ensure that Ukrainian legal framework corresponds to the European, the international principles. Um, when uh, Olena Tretikova says that many conventions are outdated, I tend to agree with her to a certain degree. Uh, Ukraine has taken upon itself um, some obligations concerning um, conventions that are outdated, outmoded, in fact, but haven't ratified four conventions. Um, we can give up on um, our obligations to those outdated 10 conventions and then um, also take upon ourselves the obligations in terms of those conventions that are really modern and uh, comprehensive today. So I think that um, this is something that we could agree on and I'm going to present to Lantritiko with a plan to that effect and I hope that uh, we will be able to work productively in this direction. Um, working together with the government on, for example, the ratification of the Convention on the Use of um, chemical substances in production, uh, which has been initiated by the um, Security Council um, of Ukraine, is also something that is happening today. Um, and we understand that without um, proper norms in the use of chemical substances in agriculture and transport, um, different kinds of industries like the chemical industry, it's impossible to talk about um, providing, ensuring safe and secure 
conditions uh, for labor. And even during the war, the work on implementing this convention is being done in Ukraine. So this makes me uh, more optimistic about how the legal framework um, in the labor sphere could work in Ukraine and um, correspond to European and international principles. Maybe there are some comments, maybe there are some remarks or questions from our panelists. I can see that Italy would like to take the floor. Yes, um, so hello again. This is what I'd like to uh, share with you. Um, time passes, uh, flies by. In fact, um, some time ago, it would have been impossible for me to imagine to um, be part of this discussion where we bring together aspect, experts from different sides, spheres, and um, we can discuss the issues we are discussing today. I think that um, the Commons Journal has done a great work um, transforming the activities. I would say that um, they are active now in social critique, but also coming up with um, social alternatives. And um, it's a real pleasure for me to listen to Sergei Sevchuk, um, whom I know as an authoritative expert. And I really hope that the um, International Labour Organization in Ukraine, um, the process of reform will not be chaotic, that there will be safety mechanisms enshrined in um, Ukrainian law. And a few words about those safety mechanisms as we know from history, um, the mechanisms of checks and balances is very important for any state to have. So this is something that we need in Ukraine in terms of the cooperation relationships between different social partners, like employers and employees, for example, in order for us to make it impossible for um, employers to take some arbitrary decisions, for example. There should be some guarantees against abuse uh, as well. For instance, there could be some national, national state level uh, three-party boards uh, which agree the positions of different partners. We also have this kind of institution organ in Ukraine, although it does not really function properly. Um, although this is the mechanism that exists in um, and works in European countries, um, including countries from the post-Soviet bloc in Romania and Bulgaria, for example, the countries that also um, have undergone this kind of process. Unfortunately, in our case, this um, institution is not really, although it exists, is not really effective or it performs a slightly different function. So when I said that um, it should be impossible for some laws to be passed without the agreement, um, the approval from the side of trade unions, I think it's fair. I think it should be um, really true without the support of the um, representatives of the trade unions. Um, it should be impossible to pass laws, implement laws. Um, unfortunately, historically speaking, we have many cases where um, laws have been adopted um, that were nonetheless widely criticized by trade unions. Um, this is not something that we should emulate in the future. Um, any kind of organ, um, any kind of um, institution um, that we organize um, when we talk about the cooperation of state and employers and employees, this kind of organization should also be on the side of the weakest party, um, workers, employees who are underrepresented. Um, so we are talking about, for example, this kind of monitoring and control um, authority of this organization to um, stop them, some processes, work processes that create danger for the workers during the war. And then we should uh, an efficient, um, just, and um, quick um, functioning court system. The way it happens now when, for example, um, 
the judicial system isn't able to inform people properly about some decisions or about the peculiarities of its functioning during the war time, this is unacceptable. So we need to evaluate the social benefits to be gained from certain mechanisms, certain laws, and we need to ensure this um, existence of safety mechanisms, the system of check and balances, and to ensure dialogue. Right now, unfortunately, I would say that employers and employees are in a very um, imbalanced conditions in terms of power. Do you see in the stream that you can write your comments, make your questions to the discussion? I remind everybody that you can ask questions, you can post your comments for our discussion for everybody. And I can see that Kirill, you have your hand raised. And we have a question to you, by the way, from the comments. So you know that there is attack against the worker rights in Ukraine and people are not allowed to protect their rights. What steps ILO has been doing in order to provide pressure on the government to protect people? So I think, Kirill, you could give your answer and also give a comment if you have some. And besides, maybe Sergei after that will uh, also answer that. So Kirill, the floor to you. Yes, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, it's indeed quite worrying uh, the initiatives which are now um, being discussed and passed through the uh, parliament in Ukraine. Uh, and it's really surprising uh, because if we look at the content of this uh, suggested legislation which deteriorates the workers' rights, this is actually the way Russia was doing. You know, for for the past years, one after another, and and it looks like more or less a copy of uh, the Russian uh, uh, labor um, law reform. Uh, so it is really strange to to, to observe it from from a distance. Um, but I, I think it has to be mentioned: the the path of Ukraine should not be the path of Russia. It's, uh, for, for all it's obvious, it has to be a different path. It's actually have to go in a different direction towards European values and European principles in terms of um, the, the labor relations. Uh, what I also wanted to add to the discussion is really the ILO, the ILO and other UN uh, system organizations, they have a, a, a huge uh, influence on the, on the situation locally. And um, there is a lot of criticism about how these structures are functioning. One of the um, interesting observation to make also, uh, also related to, to Russia, which is now an aggressive country, but for many years, Russia was highly praised by all ILO officials for so-called developed system of social dialogue which actually included a wide uh, range and uh, a huge number of uh, the collective bargaining agreements, which covered almost the whole country and formally covered uh, most of the, of the working uh, population. In fact, most of these documents were empty papers. They had no, no uh, substance. And um, we have, uh, I, I think it will be quite justified to ask the ILO about uh, how did it happen with a huge office in Moscow operating with uh, dozens of experts in the country and around, uh, which allowed this situation to be going without any critical observation. The deterioration of labor law the uh, various and many facts of violations of uh, workers' rights, and at the same time, a high-ranking uh, praise from the, from the ILO formally, with the general director of the organization visiting the country so many times, which unfortunately he didn't do, uh, he didn't manage to visit uh, Ukraine even once uh, in the terms of uh, him being in office. 
so there is a lot of uh, questions. There are lots of questions, and of course, uh, no one is ideal and perfect in this world. And um, at the same time, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, undermine the ILO. Just the opposite. We need the ILO to be more strong. And uh, in my vision and progression for the future and democratic Ukraine, I will just repeat, Ukraine should become much more active in the ILO and should be a leading country. There is a, a, every possibility and, and potential for that. Of course, if, uh, if this uh, neoliberal trend in the, uh, in the political field can be overcome. And, um, uh, but but uh, the, the potential is there and you know how to uh, unlock it. Thank you for your attention. Okay. I don't want to speak about my pessimism, but as any labor activist who has some experience, I am, a, so to say, an optimist of maximum level, but an optimist that has seen lots of bad things around him and the things intensified after the big war started in Ukraine. That's why I try to get prepared to the worst, but I plan the best. I hope that really the workers' movement in Ukraine and international trade unions, they would be able to strengthen the ILO and the ILO would be able to strengthen the social dialogue in Ukraine. And this way I expect, I hope that the thing that we fight for, like the individual freedom, right to decide, right to solve all kinds of issues at the workplace and so on, because the world of cooperation is the world of potential conflicts. But the whole world of people is the world of conflicts. We cannot read our minds. And we are trade union activists. We can see that some people don't speak about their own problems. They discuss their problems in the kitchens, but they are not ready to act in order to protect their rights. You can make some shifts from these to sell positions of people because lots of people speak about issues on their kitchens, but they do not act, they do not protect their rights, they do not try to change the course of their country. They can stop tanks that are attacking the adjacent country. I think Russian workers it was hard for them to stand for their own rights, for their own uh, self-determination. They were afraid of police and it was harder for them that we could believe, but we couldn't believe that this horrible war would be the next thing. Nobody expected such thing from Russians Right now we have this horrible enemy that is committing all kinds of war crimes, horrible war crimes. That's why I think that today's discussion was able to determine some kind of a horizon. We were able to exchange our opinions and I hope we'll follow what's going on in our country. We'll take part in this and we'll be demanding the movement in proper direction for this side without conflict but with social dialogue and general social welfare i can see two more hands raised let me give floor to you
We have two minutes. So we have up to 15 minutes for today's discussion. That's the maximum. We cannot keep our interpreters here more. So two minutes for you, Serhi. Thank you, Artem. I would like to react. Yes, the thesis was very interesting about the labor inspection. We've been working a lot in this direction and we are going to propose to introduce the national analysis uh, in order to determine the functions of the national labor inspection and to pass some its functions for example those uh, that are relevant to market to some other organization speaking about the labor reform yes the ILO is relevant and is present here and you know that the whole discussion that was going on the mobilization of the international reaction about the law drafts it was about the commentaries technical commentaries developed by the ILO Kirill I think uh, he was able to provide a very interesting informative prerequisite about collective agreements and and in what way should I say this between that there is huge difference between a big number of workers being under these collective agreements and on the other hand this agreements being void so I can state that we have uh, a very similar tendency in Ukraine yes I read a very interesting research. Uh, it was performed more than 10 years ago, but uh, still it was analysis for this collective agreements in Ukraine. And it stated more than 10 years ago, it was an issue like lack of added value in very, very big collective agreements made on the regional level or between enterprises total lack of hierarchy between regional and industry levels lack of presence of employers in some industries lack of notion of industry lack of economic activity understanding lots of issues all of them are classified and there are some conclusions so my recommendation for everybody is to read this document second share so first of all i think that the workers and the employers should be in touch in order to deal with the issues Besides, there is some dependency between or at least partial understanding that of the issue, but still there is lack of drive of political will to change the situation. So the situation can be changed, but everybody needs to put efforts, workers, trade unions, everybody. Thank you. Um, so thank Vitaly, you. And the floor is given to Vitaly. So it has been mentioned before um, today already, our country is facing unprecedented challenges. But as we have also mentioned today, our experience is not quite unique. There is a set of uh, different mechanisms and knowledge and so on uh, in particular 
worked upon by the International Labour Organization, which shows us how we can deal with um, such kinds of challenges in the time of the war or after the war. I focused on the negative developments in uh, labour legislation in such countries as um, Hungary, for example, but also we need to mention um, the inclusive positive development um, based on the examples of Poland, for example, where they also had this radical transformation uh, from state government economy to market economy, um, also Croatia, um, Slovenia, um, countries like Croatia faced the war, for example, um, and implemented the labor legislation, which um, work, works in many ways in the interests of employers and employees, where we have, for example, boards of workers, boards of employees, who basically take part in decision making together with the employers according to the best European um, practices. And this is something I need, we need to pay attention to in terms of labor legislation. And as to social and economic development, I hope that the main motive for the development of economy will be the um, social justice, um, creating um, really humane conditions for labor, taking care of the workers. And in that case, I think that um, gender inequality and uh, precarious um, and informal employment, those things will be mitigated, will decrease. Um, I know that uh, our situation is very far from ideal, but I think that all of us will do everything possible in order for the post-war development of Ukraine to be a really positive um, experience uh, in order for uh, our post-war development and reconstruction to become a stellar example of how a country after war can be developed in the best interest of the society for its benefit. So. Um, I hope that uh, people in other countries of the world will be proud of us and we ourselves will be proud of our work. Um, goodbye, everyone. I was happy to be here today from, from Social Movement, Social Network Organization. Thank you, everyone, for finding time to um, join us today in this um, difficult time. Thank you for trying to um, stay optimistic about our situation. Um, I would say that this ability to stay optimistic is actually a characteristic of the Ukrainian people. Our ability to look into the future and to find something optimistic, something that gives us hope even in the darkest of times. Um, and I think that uh, our discussion today has been productive. Thanks everyone, Ukraine will win and we will be ready to implement the most progressive practices um, the best kind of legislation in the country. Um, the country which will receive a lot of investment is receiving investment today and is um, something that everyone around the world is looking at. And I hope that the investments we receive, the attention will, um, we receive um, will become an important resource. And in the process of reconstruction, the rights of our workers will be guaranteed by the Ukrainian laws, by international legislation, and that the organizations monitoring these processes will play uh, a key role in protecting the rights of workers because they can guide or um, determine certain trends uh, in uh, the labor sphere uh, because they are the ones who protect the rights of the workers to a decent existence, decent life for themselves and for their families and ensure their own future and the future of their country. So thank you for being part of this discussion. Um, peace. Um, let your life be peaceful and I wish all of us to achieve victories as possible. Goodbye.